Well, she knows when I'm coming. <laughs> I yell at my Alexa all day long. It's the only person I can yell at. Get away with it. I don't really yell. I have fun with the office, so they really think I'm speaking to some. Hi, everybody. Morning. Hello. My birth, I know now. Hi, everyone. Good morning, Rabbi. Good morning. Who said that? Dana. Dana, Dana how are you feeling? I'm coming along. I'm, I'm almost there. Good. Yeah. We've had yeah. a long battle. Yeah, it's, uh, two it's been two weeks. Two weeks with that. Yeah. Charlie, how's Bob doing? She doesn't hear me. He had a little surgery the other day. Good morning, okay. Rabbi. Good morning, Rabbi. Good morning. Good to see you all. Good to see you all. I don't see my London crowd here. All right. Oh, all right. Let's see where we left off. I heard just a few little things here. A few little things. Yeah. Please Are you mute. mute, everybody? Who said that? So, how's yeah, everyone? Of okay. course. <laughs> what? I missed that. What? Did you hear? That? It was. It was Dana. I'm. I'm helping you. <laughs> okay. Oh, you said, you said mute, and it was Dana. Yes, it was Dana. She's my mute. Never mind. It's mute. I'm not right. So I hope everybody's well. We're in the middle of moving, so I don't know where I am, what time of day it is. We're moving out. Then we're moving back into another place into in our permanent place. So, so you're moving to a permanent house? Or about a, a temporary housing right now for two weeks, and then don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> Close to the shul. It's on Palm and Mound, right on the corner there. You know where you know where it is. Yeah, it's a great building. Fantastic, but it's ready. We're not closed on it yet. It's you cannot believe how much how many signatures I've had to make on the last for and, and initials, initials, initials. Just one more document, right? You know, and Ella, I got so uh, yeah, all you do is sign papers. They almost like discourage you from, from buying anything because you just want to, I don't want any more signatures. <laughs> but it's, you've got the mortgage people, you've got the condo people, you've got the, uh, who else, some title insurance people, they all have got their, they all have their own. There's no, there's no unified, we have our well, anyway. Our agents done very well in putting all together, but it, it really is something. Sure. No, it's the policy now of the synagogue. Yeah, oh no. Unless you're in the this is voted on. The only times a mask are required is to be in the sanctuary. Right. Not in the sanctuary, you do not need to wear a mask. That is right. the new rule that was passed last Tuesday night at the would be. Right. So you're absolutely fine. I just want to make sure well, you can wear it if you wish, but it's yeah. not required according to the halakha of the temple. Do you know, it just, this has absolutely nothing to do with the cloud. I mean, this whole, the bigger picture of this whole COVID thing will be the relationship between science and medicine, because that's one thing that the experts never tell you is that science and medicine is constantly changing. I'll give you, for example, my, my dear son, Eitan, he dug up an interview with, with Dr. Fauci from May of 2020, in which he said at that time, we don't know about vaccinations. They could cause more harm than they do. Good. I have proof of that. They said, I'm very leery about any vaccinations coming. So it just shows you within the, in a matter of months. Now he now he says you've got to vaccinate your five-year-olds. I don't want to look around my science. That's what science is. Science is yes. biology changes. Exactly. You know, it's premise and then we find out that's not true. That's you know, right. Years ago, they used to think that all 
ulcers were caused by stress and so forth. Now we know it's bacteria. You know, people used to walk around with big lots of milk. That's exactly milk. my point. And it's and it's okay that he said that, but but there should be an admission of some humility that that the science <laughs> that the science is constantly evolving. Marshall, the, the classic example I, I uh, have been using lately, and you could you could point to many of them, and I'll finish with this. Uh, in the 19, I think it was right after World War II, there was a very famous Jewish doctor who did research and won two Nobel Prizes for his research on lobotomies. And the research was that lobotomies would eliminate mental retardation, this mental disability. And everybody was, I forgot the name of this dog. They were running to this doctor to get their mental retardation fix. That was the science of the day for a good three, four years. And Joseph, the reason why I know about it is that Joseph Kennedy had the daughter Rosemary, and he was embarrassed by her being Whoa. whatever. She was the sweetest person. Everybody loved her, but he was embarrassed. She was an embarrassment to him. So she ran to this doctor and said, you've got to, we won't tell anybody, you've got to do lobotomy surgery on her. And they arranged to have her uh, do it in some clinic in Minnesota or whatever. Maybe it was the, uh, what's the famous clinic? Mayo. Mayo Clinic, I think it was there. And he did the surgery and completely destroyed her. I mean, they proved very quickly the lobotomies were the worst thing you could possibly do to any human being. But he won two Nobel Prizes. Everybody thought, oh, science. And that's the point, Marshall. It's changing every, every day. That's what science is all about. That's the way I grew up learning about science. You know, we know now Galileo was right, the 16th century, but the science of his day said he was a nutcase for believing that the earth revolved around the sun. He was in prison for that. The science, not to compare the science of then to today, but it just is another proof that science is constantly evolving. And I believe that when they look at it as a retrospect, retrospective on what's happening now, people are going to be, it just won't believe what we've been doing. That's my general instinct. It's going to be the opposite. They could say, we saved the world because we have I don't think that, yeah, it could be. I mean, we don't know. We're not going to know what's going on for another 25 years as far as the way we handle it. But it is true that, that you know, if I had a chance to speak to the, the medical experts, I'd say, listen, you've sent so many mixed messages to people. How do you expect people to, to, to know what to do? Wear a mask, don't wear a mask, free mask, no mask, don't touch, clean your food, don't clean your food. That's okay, distancing, uh, you can do it inside, not outside is fine. Oh, you should be clear outside just in case. Minors, they don't need vaccinations. Now they need vaccine. I mean, if you really went through what we've been through, it's it's astounding, and that's why we're all all mixed up. That's my view. All right, let's let's uh, move on here. Let's go on. We're going to do finish. Uh, I just a couple things I want to say about prayer, and then we're gonna. Our unit is really Shabbat. And we want to start that. But let me just uh, say a couple things. Uh, first of all, we never discussed the Musaf service. <laughs> Musaf, which we add an additional Aliyah and Kedusha on Shabbat, on holidays, Rosh Chodesh, as a special Musaf. Uh, yeah, all Rosh Rosh Chodeshim. Um, we have, uh, we have, and, and the, during the Cholam we have, we have, ex Musaf means literally additional. So we have an additional Amida and Kedusha. Why the heck do we need an additional Amida? Isn't one enough in the morning? No, says our, our tradition. And does anybody know the reason why we add a Musaf service? Sure, because they had an additional sacrifice. That's exactly right. There was an additional, that's exactly right. The, the key word there is Korban. 
sacrifice that was brought on the Shabbat and the holidays. And in remembrance of the Beit HaMikdash of Jerusalem, we have a Musaf addition. If you notice the wording, I, we don't have our Sidarim with us here, but if you notice the wording in all the Musafim, they will make reference to the offerings, the sacrificial offerings that were brought uh, at the temple. Now, I'll just bend about the, the opposers to Musaf started with Mordechai Kaplan at the seminary. Mordechai Kaplan, the rationalist, he said, this is ridiculous to remember the sacrifices in Jerusalem. And he, when he started his uh, unique service, he cut out Musaf from his synagogue's tefillah. So we don't have to do that anymore. The reform movement has completely cut Musaf. You'll never go to reform synagogue that has any Musaf Amida. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think any reform congregation would, uh, would add Musaf. The conservative movement, certainly the Orthodox, we're not discussing them, but the conservative movement by and large, I don't know of any synagogue. Well, I'm gonna throw something out at you too, the way I, we did it in, in London. <coughs> Uh, I don't know of any uh, conservative synagogue that has thrown out the Musaf service. We certainly haven't here. We do Musaf every week. And frankly, I'm comfortable with that. I feel there is a place of remembering Jerusalem. I think that's very important. To me, when I do Musaf, I, I've, I, I link myself with that historical tie. And has that led? Why isn't there more to it? than just the sacrifice and the reason that the sacrifice was added should enhance the reason for doing it. And the additional sacrifice was done to enhance Shabbat and make it more holy and things like that. And so that's that's really the reason for the Musaf. It's not because there was a sacrifice, it's because they were enhancing Shabbat and festivals and Rosh Hashanah and well, when they were doing it. I think you raise a great point. The, the, the bottom line reason is remembrance of the Beit HaMikdash in Yerushalayim. But I agree with you. I think there, it, is, it, it makes it different from a Monday morning minion or a Thursday morning minion. And having Shabbat, it's, it's more festive. It's, it adds to, the, uh, adds to the holiness, the sanctity of the day. And I, and I think that our reticence to mess around with Musaf is good. I wouldn't, I, I don't think that would be a smart thing to do. Besides, the reform have done it, and they always had kind of wobbly relationship with Jerusalem and Zionism and, and Eretz Israel. And I think that we still need to uh, hold firm on those historical ties. And I, I you know, very powerful me, I can only imagine my grandparents, my great grandparents on Shabbat, you know, in their shtetls in Ukraine thinking of Jerusalem. That's powerful. And I, that's the reason why we're there today. And I think we should hold on to that historical tie. That makes sense? And uh, yeah, that's how I feel about it. Now, I just want to throw this idea out here. It's interesting. Every, every conservative saying, well, they're, well, they're not cutting out Musaf. They're trying to decide the most efficient, the best way of getting both Amidot, Shacharit, and Musaf in there without uh, increasing the time of the services to a point where people really get. Someone, what someone said to me, Rabbi, we started 8 30 in the morning in my shul. We read the whole Torah portion, we repeated both Amidot. We got out of there at 12 30. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if you can get away with that anymore. Uh, that's an awfully long service. My synagogue growing up, that's how long they were. Service, I think they started at nine and finished at one. We did that in the late 20s. I'll have to find out if it's still being done. But that I'll they see. repeated both Ami, Amidot and read the whole portion. Well, that adds to the time of the service significantly. But they were trying to cut it short. They were trying to figure out. Well, you have to cut short. somewhere. Right. And the other thing is, there were bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs almost every weekend or most weekends. That adds, definitely adds to the time of the service. And you have a kid going, 
Baruch Atah Adonai, you know, it's long. Um, but um, so we're trying to find ways of abbreviating. Now, we have one tool that is traditional, and that's called Hechi Kedusha. That is, you do the first part together and the remainder silent. Um, and we've done that here to shorten our services. The upside of that is it's traditional, it's allowed. The downside is that people lose track, perhaps, of the rest of the Amidah that we're constantly doing silently. You know, there's something that enhances the prayer when, we, when you do it together, you learn it a lot better. So, for example, every time I get to Musaf and I get to the after the Kedusha, uh, is Yismichu um, uh, Hashama, I mean, not Yismichu. Uh, the um, what's it, what is it on the uh, in the Musaf service um, for Shabbat? The singing. What, what, and I'm blanking out for a second. But there are a lot of melodies. The door, that, door. Is that clear? Well, yes. that's one. But no, it's the it's the next uh, text here. It's driving me crazy here. Uh, that we sing anyway. Do we have a seat door? Yeah. This is driving me nuts. Oh, here we go. Claire, I didn't see you before. Good morning. Good morning. I was um, watching um, Paul's mother's funeral in Bogota. Oh, yeah, yeah. She died yesterday. Oh, here. Uh, let me hear. I know that. I've been in touch with Paul. Yeah. I know he's not, he's not uh, able to go there. The next yeah, so here we go. This next yeah, one. The next page. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Yisvechu b'malachu d'cha shomre 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 Shabbat v'kore onek Shabbat. You know, those melodies that get lost if you don't do them together. So there's some downside to that. Now, Claire's here. She knows that in my synagogue in London, this is what they used to do. They used, I don't know if they're still doing it, but what they did was they did the Shachrit Amidah completely silent, the whole thing silent. And then the Musaf Amidah, they daven the whole thing together. So there was no Hechi Kedusha. I inherited that. I was never quite comfortable with that, but that's we worked with the community. And it was a way of saying, and there's a time for silent Amidah, and then there's a time for communal repetition. So different, different ways of dealing with that situation. I have a question. Sure. Is it possible um, with, them, with a lot of the synagogues attempts to shorten the service to make it in you know, a certain time frame? Does that help keep more members in the conservative group rather than wanting to shift away to reform or? because they don't think the service should be so long. Is there something to that? It, it, people I'm, I'm, I can't speak for every conservative center, but I'm sure there's a lot to that. And every community has to, has to adjust to their reality. I've always believed that our obligation is to do the right thing. And we have a good product. We do it right. We're authentic. We, we're not a reformed congregation. And that's our uniqueness. And, and we can't be constantly worried what they're doing because we're doing it right or we're doing it right for our community. And I don't think that we need to, I don't, believe me, I don't think of whether we should have Musaf or not because well, the reform is not doing it and people are gonna say, oh, I can't stand going to uh, Temple Beth Shalom because they have a Musaf. And I, I, I don't think, I think people are more we, we had some guests this last Shabbat. She's very active with the Reformed Congregation in St. Petersburg and she loved our service. So we must be doing something right. We have a beautiful traditional service. It's about two hours and 10 minutes. Announcements are about 10 minutes. <laughs> the rest is two hours. And I think we do it well when there's a lot of singing, a lot of participation, which is the you know, to me, the, the gold of our congregation is, is uh, the number of people who, who lay in the Torah, who lead the service. 
it's a it's a it's a beautiful part of what we do. So I I I'm not a believer in messing with that at all. It's a, it's a golden product. Let's just keep enhancing what we're doing. That's my view. Unless I'm out of touch with what's happening in the congregation, I think that people coming and the numbers and and what's happening here is is very special and. Um, I wouldn't mess with that at all. Uh, we mentioned the role of the Kaddish. Um, the Aleinu I didn't speak about, uh, the end of the service in which we have this beautiful close with the vision that one day all the nations of the world will, all the peoples of the world will recognize God. It does, I always say this emphatically, it doesn't say that everybody's gonna become Jewish. That's not our goal. Thankfully, I mean, the world would really be an interesting place if everybody was Jewish. That's not been our goal. But the goal is that there is always in Judaism a, a universal ethical moral standard that we do try to uphold the rest of the nations of the world and the religions of the world to hold. And uh, that is a universal dream that everybody will walk to God a recognition of uh, a moral universe in their own way. Uh, and one day when that happens, when there's a mutual coming together morally and ethically, there will be a universal peace. And that's the way we finish every service. And, and we recognize the special role that the Jewish people have played in bringing that about. Our fate has not been the fate of the other nations. Our fate is to bring the rest of the nations to God. It's been our, our mission to be an orla goyim, as the prophet Isaiah said, a light into the nations of the world since the beginning of our existence. And if you note, you don't have the prayer books, but if you know the beginning of the service before Shachari begins, we recite Nishmad Kochai Elohenu. We pray that every soul of the earth will come towards God. So it's like a bookend. We begin with that thought, and a lot of the language is repeated from the Nishmat and Alenu. So you see your service. If if we were to summarize what we've done, there's universal here, universal there, the beginning and the end. And then we have all the details in the middle. We have creation. Revelation, redemption, the Shema, the Amida, the reading of the Torah, Musaf, remembering Jerusalem, and then we finish with another universal. I basically summarize what we do in the last, in 15 seconds. That is the symphony that we listen to every Shabbat, all, every movement. It's, it's nice to compare this to, mu to, to music because movements of a symphony convey different emotions, and different thoughts. But we need all four movements. You know, if you were, if I were to, uh, it's interesting, and I have done this, for someone's interested in classical music, I'd love to teach a course in classical music. I've never done that before, but I would love it. Um, when I, if you, if you were to teach Beethoven's work, for example, in the symphonies, it would be very hard to say to a student, you know, just listen to the, sec to the second movement and you'll get the, you really have to listen to all four to, to get at the, the, the book piece of music that Beethoven wrote. Uh, so you can come and just listen to the Torah reading, but you miss the whole, you know, you miss the whole thing. Yeah. Why, why does the, the long chant, like the Central East, they cut out the section of the Alenu, which really surprised me. I was totally interested in the book. They, they cut out a section in the Alenu here? It's Sinai, yeah. Oh, it's Sinai they did. They probably you know, cut. I don't know what it, what it is we're cutting out. <laughs> I don't I, I've never been a Sinai. I don't know what they do, but I would assume they're cutting out the first paragraph of the Elenu, which speaks of the fact that we Jews have a different role in the world. It's been a reform shtick that kind of, kind of an embarrassment with 
recognizing the unique and special role of the Jewish people. You know, when we recite that our faith has not been the same as other nations, we're not saying we're better. Every, every religion, every nation should feel that they have a different mission to accomplish for the rest of the world. I don't know why we Jews have always been so embarrassed to tell the world that we are a very unique people that has had a special mission since the beginning of history. So that's it's, it's, it's what I mentioned this last Shabbat about Joseph, who made a great comeback to being Jewish, but he had he revealed his insecurities by telling his brothers, when Pharaoh tell asked you what you do you, what you do for a living, don't tell them that you're shepherds. Being a shepherd in Egypt is a very bad thing. So shh, quiet. You'll you'll say that I, he said I will lie to him. I'll say that you raise livestock. And he wanted his brothers not to tell Pharaoh that, that they were shepherds. So when Pharaoh meets the brothers, what does he say? What do you do for a living? And the brothers completely ignore Joseph. Remember, they're coming from Eretz Yisrael. I'm going to hide the fact that what's wrong with being a shepherd? So they ignored Joseph. It's very interesting. They ignored Joseph. And they said, Pharaoh, we're shepherds. So if Joseph were standing there, he probably would have been, uh-oh. He probably wanted to dig a hole, but the Pharaoh was great. He said, oh, that's wonderful. He didn't, he didn't respond at all, which is only proof to me when I, when I read that section that Jews who try to hide who they are, increase hatred. But the Jews who are proud of who they are, like the brothers, proved to be even more secure than Joseph. And maybe Joseph learned from that. Stop it already. Stop trying to pretend that you're something different. And it worked. And the, and the so-called non-Jewish enemy didn't bat an eyelid. I think that's been one of the great things that's happened to Jews since the foundation of the state of Israel, both in Israel and in the diaspora. And that is we're much less insecure about who we are. Because if you read the, you know, a lot of the history of Jews during troubled times, which we're getting into in the other class, uh, we tended to hide. We tended not to, not to be too Jewish in their eyes because they despised us. But I think now uh, it's a shame for any Jew to feel any less by saying, listen, I keep kosher. I, I, I'm Jewish. I take pride in my Judaism. We are unique. We have a, a role in the world and I'm gonna defend it to the nth degree. And, and if they don't like me for that, you know, the, the heck with them. But the fact is they'll respect me more for being who I am. The, the Jews who tried to hide, and this is off subject here, it's really a history component, but those Jews who tried to hide who they were in Germany and elsewhere in Europe were the first ones to go to the camps. It didn't work. That total acculturation assimilation totally failed them. Uh, and it's, it's really one of the tragic stories that um, we just said, if, if, oh, someone from Israel said if there had been an APAC, someone told me this, that this was mentioned by one of the Israeli, if there had been an APAC before World War II, there wouldn't have been such a, a horrible mass killing of Jews, Shoah. So not, not to blame the Jewish victims for what happened. But um, today, uh, we learn that the best way to come with anti-Semitism is by being direct, forceful, going to the courts, demonstrating when things are wrong, going to our political leaders, and finally saying, we're not going to take it anymore. I have to tell you, we were having a visit. Len knows this. We're having a visit. Claire knows as well. Damon Lesnar is coming uh, with his Natasha. I think um, at New Year's Shabbat, and he's been he's been a real force in in uh, the UK in combating anti-Semitism. He's really been marvelous. And there was an incident um, during Hanukkah on Oxford Street in London, which is the main 
shopping street in London. It was filled with people all the time. And there were Israeli and Jewish kids from the UK and they were on the bus apparently and they were singing Hanukkah songs, dreidel, sivivon, I don't know what it was. And they were mobbed by, um, sadly, uh, all kinds of um, hate mongers. They were banging on the door and they were yelling, uh, you know, Jewish epithets and, and Zionists uh, go home and all that. And they, it, it was very scary. But to make matters worse, the BBC reported there was there were half the group were Israeli kids. The BBC reported that um, there was shouting in Hebrew that were anti-Islamic slurs that egged on the those who attacked the Jewish kids. A total lie. The um, Israeli kids were shouting, "We need help." were in danger. I don't remember the exact wording, but they were yelling that in Hebrew because that was their, that's the, you know, when you're scared, you speak your native language. And so look how the BBC completely distorted that, trying to find some justification for those who were attacking Jewish kids. So it's a real big thing now with the BBC, there were demonstrations. I would have, Claire knows I would have been on the front lines demonstrating peacefully against the Santa, the BBC is refusing to apologize. And Damon is one of the great leaders of this movement to combat anti-Semitism. I'm very proud of him. So uh, I believe that there is a place for peaceful protest. Uh, I've seen it work and uh, we have to stand up when these kinds of things happen in our dignified way. As we did for Soviet Jewry, as we do for Israel, we have to. Don't be scared. Don't be scared of who we are. Um, the only other thing, I have other things with Birkin on my zone, but we'll skip that. The only thing I, other thing I want to mention with her is nus, the word nusach. Nusach. Nusach, it literally means form. Nusach is form. And again, a unique thing in, in Jewish tradition is that um, we have musical nusachot, musical forms for every part of our service. There's a different nusach for weekday, which is like flat. That would be the weekday nusach. There's other ways of doing it too. And then Shabbat, the nusach changes. For example, the weekday we say, but on Shabbat we sing If we change the nusach, the musical form to create a different mood for Shabbat and the holidays have a different nusach and they have a different nusach for the shacharit, the morning and a different nusach for the musaf service and the same for Shabbat musaf is different Shabbat Mincha has a different nusach, and then you get into Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. There's a different nusach for the Torah reading, for Shacharit, for Musaf. So a good chazan, I know basics, but a good chazan knows every nusach, every you know all the different Torah tropes over there. But it's good for us to know that the music has played a huge role in creating the mood of the different parts of our service. So let's go to Shabbat. Any questions from anybody on prayer? Larry's here. Hello. I recognize that door. Anybody? Any questions? Okay, let's go on the Shabbat. Um, I cannot even begin to tell you what Shabbat has done to people who begin observe, really observing Shabbat. You don't have to do everything, but we should know where it comes from and why it's important. And it's tremendous place in our um, religious, our beautiful religious tradition. The history of Shabbat is quite interesting. I remember where I read it, but some years ago that in the Babylonian, the Mesopotamian calendar, the seventh day was considered to be a cursed day. It's considered to be a cursed day. 
And it was also in many, in many of the anti-Semitic um, diatribes against Jews during the Greco-Roman period, they would always point to the fact that the Jews were lazy because they had Shabbat. They even rested their animals. And they had this notion, if you weren't, if a slave wasn't working seven days, then you weren't taking advantage of your, your property well enough. And so you have this unbelievable change in the thinking of humanity that to be a human being is not just to be working all, all every day, but there's a soul of a human being that needs to be nurtured. I mean, look how far advanced um, the Torah Jewish thinking was with regard to that, that even your animals needed to rest, even your products, the Shemitah year, the sabbatical of the land every seven years had to rest. Um, for those of you who are students of American history, uh, one of the problems of the Confederacy before the Civil War is that the cotton product was destroying the soil. They were overworking the soil. And that's why um, it has been said by many historians that people who are living in the South had to look for new territory. You know, part of the conflict before the Civil War was that the Confederacy really wanted to expand its slave empire. And a lot of the reason for that is that the cotton product was destroying the soil. They needed to find new places for that. And what they forgot was what the Torah says, that you can't do that to the land. You've got to let the land rest and be nurtured. You need to have your, your animals need to rest. They need to be fed first before you're even fed. And every human being has dignity, whether it be a slave or a slave owner, everybody's the same on Shabbat, theoretically. That's the idea of Shabbat. Shabbat, keeping the Shabbat is the only ritual mentioned in the entire 10 commandments. It's commandment number four. Zachor at Yom HaShabbat in, uh, in Exodus and Shamor at Yom HaShabbat, keep the Sabbath in, uh, in Deuteronomy. Uh, and that, and the foundation of the Shabbat was to bring a day of peace in all of its different shades to, um, to our people uh, and to teach our, our society. There are a lot of different parts of this with regard to nature and with each other, which we're going to get to in a second. Very interesting sidelight here. Shabbat is the only day of the week in the Jewish calendar that has a name. We don't have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We have Yom Rishon, Yom Sheni, Yom Shlishi, Yom Revi, Yom Chamishi, Yom Shishi, and Shabbat. It's the only, only day of the week that has a name. Because the idea was, and this is from Breshit, the first chapter in Genesis. The idea is that the whole purpose of life was to lead to Shabbat. The purpose of work was to lead to Shabbat. And there was a kind of a, a machloket, a dispute with Benjamin Franklin on this issue. Benjamin Franklin, who was one of my great heroes, not detracting from, but he is considered to be one of the founders of the Protestant ethic. And what he wrote in the early stages of American history was of the value of work. And he said, the purpose of the Sabbath was to rest. Of course, their Sabbath was Sunday. Rest so that they could work more efficiently the rest of the days of the week. Which is the exact reverse of the Jewish concept. The purpose of work is to lead to the Sabbath. The purpose in Benjamin Franklin's view was that the Sabbath would lead to better work. So it's really interesting psychologically. What is the purpose of life? Is the purpose of life our career? Or is the purpose of our life a work? Or is the purpose of our life really to find the peace of our soul and connections with our people? Uh, I, I happen to favor the Jewish view. I think it's genius, wise, it's moral, 
And this is an extremely important message that we all need a Shabbat. Uh, whenever I run into somebody who is constantly on the phone, making appointments, trying to earn money, I feel so, so sorry for them. Like they completely lose sight of what's most important in life, completely lose it. And uh, we've, we're, we're still in the battle with that, with the darn cell phones and the computers and all the things that, that occupy so much of our time. Another um, great way of understanding Judaism in general is that, I'll, and I'm asked this question a lot, Rabbi, what's the difference in, in being, why do I have to do, keep the rituals of Judaism don't all the religions believe in the same thing? We all want peace. We all want harmony. Of course, even that statement's not quite true. There's different aims involved. But the uniqueness of Judaism is that when we espouse our ideals, we are instructed, commanded to live by them. And that's why Jewish life without the mitzvah becomes an empty shadow without the enactment, the realization of the ideals that we preach. So while a lot of religions espouse very nice ideals, the real question is, how are you going to get there? And what Judaism is, what the Torah really is, is a blueprint for saying, we espouse ideals, let's find a way to live them. Let's find a way to live by them. And the two most, in my view, and I, I think uh, it's pretty safe to say, the two most important ideals in Judaism and the Torah are, Peace, shalom, and the sanctity of life, the sanctity of life. And isn't it interesting that the two most important rituals in all of Judaism, that is the rituals that have the most written about them in the Torah, not even close. I think Passover would be the third runner up but the two that have the most written about them would be Shabbat and Kashrut. Shabbat, Shalom, is a day to live peace. Kashrut is our practice every single day that enables us to sanctify life. If you were to introduce someone to Jewish life and he or she said, I want to start being more Jewish. Those would be the two most important rituals to have them, have them do. I'm going to try to prove that in the course of uh, our, our uh, next few sessions. So we're starting with Shabbat. And it's beautiful. I, I, the, it was the security guard asked me when I come in. He said, what would be an exact translation of Shabbat Shalom? I hear everybody saying it. And I mentioned, you know, have a Sabbath of peace. Uh, he liked that. He said, that's so beautiful. He's an interesting guy, by the way, Daryl. <laughs> he asked me lots of questions. Um, so peace is what it's all about. And everything, every detail of Shabbat, really, the question has to be, how is this related to the uh, ideal of living peace? Not just talking about peace living peace. This is the Jewish way. You have to live peace. So the commandments of the Shabbat are basically divided into four sections, four avenues leading to peace. First is finding peace within ourselves, an individual process of peace. We all need space, thought, prayer, a sense of continuity, of rest, of study, of reflection, 
we can't live like robots constantly spinning and working. Everybody needs that time. And if someone's not taking that time for him or herself, uh, it really is a dysfunction as far as our tradition would consider that to be. And I'm, I'm sure all of you can relate to that in some way. You need to stop at some point with uh, my signature. I love telling everybody on Friday when they bother me with the mortgage company, it's Friday at three o'clock. I'm not dealing with anything until Sunday morning. Okay, so you get the message, you know, bug off. <laughs> I, I don't have to be signing papers all day long every day. So that's very important. And how we, we realize that space, everybody's got different ways of doing that. I happen to like reading and, and studying on Shabbat. And, my, and, and of course, uh, walking and resting and eating well. I mean, those, those are all great uh, and being with people. And that's the second one. The second thing we're supposed to try to do and, and the laws of Shabbat, the mitzvot of Shabbat instruct us is that we're trying, we try to create a society in which we uh, have shalom bayit, peace in the house with other people. That's what community is all important, is so important. We're not supposed to argue on Shabbat. There are no meetings on Shabbat. It's enough six days of the week. We're supposed to be there for each other, encourage each other. Of course, in the old days, we used to give hugs, but you know what I mean? We're, we value being with people, making peace between people. We try to create ideal communities. We're already there at Temple Bet Shalom. It's a, it's a joy to be here. People really do bond together and you have a great sense of peace. That's because the Shabbat is all about the dignity of every person. We don't ask you know, whether someone's a truck driver or a neurosurgeon, it doesn't matter on Shabbat. We're all Jews, we're all there in synagogue and we all respect each other. Um, I have a note here about um, Isaac Deutscher. Isaac Deutscher was a very well-known Bolshevik. His uh, biographies on Stalin and Trotsky uh, are still, even though he had less information than he did, he broke away from Stalin. Uh, and um, very sadly, what happened to him, he, he broke off from Trotsky, broke off from Stalin. He's one of the typical Jews that thought they were changing the world by joining the revolution and then, uh, ended up in gross anti-Semitism and, and leaving. There is a collection of essays, and I'm, I haven't read them in a long time, but it's a collection of essays from Isaac Gocher called The Non-Jewish Jew. And he writes a lot about his uh, upbringing. And he's trying to, trying to figure out how he became a social revolutionary. He never engaged in violence, by the way. It was all theoretical. That's where he broke with Trotsky and he broke with Stalin, but because he really was a scholar. But he said he has a beautiful chapter in there on how he grew up with Shabbat. He said, when I grew up, and they all came from the shtetl. When I grew up in the shtetl, we were so poor. We had nothing. He said, my parents would save a little piece of fish all week. We couldn't eat that all week long. But on Shabbat evening, we had our special meal. And my mother would dress up beautifully on Friday night. And my father would wear his robe. I guess he came from a, like a Hasidic background, robe, hat. He looked like, he said, he looked like a prince. He looked like a king. He said, I learned from those Shabbat dinners every week that no matter how poor a person could be, that there was such inner respect for the soul of a human being. He said, my parents taught me that. He didn't. He became a social revolution like so many of them, but he really didn't rebel against his background. He was trying to figure out why he became who he became. And he says, because of Shabbat, I realized that what I wanted was that every human being 
needed to feel that dignity that I grew up with. And he credits the Shabbos, the Shabbat with that. That in his community saw people who had nothing. Jews were dirt poor in the shtetl. But on Shabbat, the whole world changed. Imagine what that did to, it, to that generation. That's why they began, not, they either became leftist revolutionaries or they became uh, Zionists. They had dreams of a better world. That's what Shabbat does. It creates a dream of a better world. And that starts with being with people. No arguing, no arguing, no appointments, a day of song, study, dinner table. A beautiful rabbinic notion that when we eat, you know, the reason why we wash our hands before we break bread is not because our hands aren't clean. It's because our tables are like altars of the temple, like the Mizbeach in Jerusalem. So that's called you know, lifting the dignity of people. And we should know that history. It played a huge part in keeping Jews alive. What, if, what was the, um, I think it was Achad Ha'am who said, that more than the Jews kept the Sabbath, the Sabbath kept the Jewish people alive through all the generations. They never, they never could give up of their dignity. And, and if you're taking my class on Wednesday morning, you'll see how easy we're getting into the more difficult stages of Jewish history, how easy it would have been for Jews to just give up. But they didn't. We had Sabbath, we had our holidays too, but in all, so the Shabbat is the most important of all the holiday observances. And we could prove that, by the way, Len knows and Susan, on Shabbat, it's seven or more aliyot. On Rosh Hashanah, it's only supposed to be five. So our holy day, our Yom Kippur, six, but not seven. So peace for ourselves, people, uh, peace with other people, and then third, peace with nature. Now, this is a really interesting uh, kudo for the advanced degree by which our tradition, our Jewish people and the Torah knows about the need to nurture nature, the environment. One day a week, nature come, goes to rest. You're not, the, you're not allowed to pluck a tree of its fruit. You're not allowed to mow the lawn. And the very religious won't even walk on grass, even though it's not prohibited, but highly sensitive to the importance of recognizing that God gave us an earth that we need to nurture. We can't keep destroying it and using it every single day. Uh, and so much of Shabbat is about leaving, even to the degree that carrying things, moving objects from the private domain into the public domain is pro technically prohibited on Shabbat because you're not allowed to interfere with the, the separation between the public thoroughfare and the private. Um, so all those matters of nature, letting nature rest, and it's become very popular today because of the interest in uh, climate control and the environment. The Jewish tradition was way ahead. I, I believe that in 1970, way back then, Norman Mailer, the famous writer, ran for mayor of New York, and he proposed that New York City would shut down one day a week, all of its factories, all of its fumes. You know, uh, he, he was roundly defeated, uh, but it was an interesting proposal, which um, I don't know if that's going to work today, but uh, it was an interesting idea. And, and one of the beautiful things you do see in Israel, you know, it's a big country, they, things, some things can't stop, but it's beautiful to see every the chlorus, everything closed, the factory shut, and uh, this day that is unique from the rest of the days of the week. Yeah. Um, when we shut down, and a lot of the world shut down during the pandemic with the lockdowns, there's a really big example of how uh, a lot of countries like India, the pollution started to go away, and it was nature healing because everything had come to a standstill. I was like, they. It was just magnificent how, how much the air refreshed, the world refreshed itself. You're but right. I, I don't know who's done a study about that, but that's, they that's that interesting. Yeah. That. And India and China are way out of control with the fossil burning, but that's a different story. 
There has to be control. There has to be some kind of moderation between the needs for society and the need to protect our environment. And uh, I think we all can agree on that. Um, it's just a matter of how you get there. You shut down. Uh, Judy, one of the ways also of describing Judaism, I mentioned living your ideals. That's taking the abstract and making them real. That's a very Jewish thing. But another thing is moderation. This was my Maimonides' big thing. Don't be an extremist. You can have a fanatic in environment. We have a lot of those. And I'll give you a, the, the example I always use, and there are many others. In South, it's either Southwestern Ohio or Southeastern Ohio. They're shaking your head. Did I get that wrong? I, I think you meant a very disordered view. What? I didn't hear? I think you have a very disordered view of, of, of an event. I, I don't think that that's, that's really... But I haven't even mentioned it yet. Yeah, you've mentioned it before. Did I? Yeah. Well, this is what I heard, that there was, a, there was an endangered fish and they blocked down all the uh, plans to grow the area. People lost their jobs. And there was an increase in suicide. But there are other examples, Len. I mean, there oh, have I, been. I, I use some other examples. OK, I'll use other examples. We'll have to do. Uh... The point is, we do have some uh, extremists with good causes, but become extremists that do more damage than good. That's all. But um, you have a good example? There, there, I'd have to, I'd have to. Uh, the government wants to destroy the forests in Maine by putting in um, what do you call solar panels, taking down acres and acres of trees at the bottom of the mountain and putting in solar panels. There's no sun in Maine. <laughs> well, there's an issue in California, Lynn. There's an issue in California about the, uh, the trees. There have been a lot of forest fires there. And there's been, an, uh, the environmentalists don't want to cut down the trees. And there's been some issue about not, not cutting down a certain amount in order to prevent forest fires. Yeah. They created other environmental yeah. problems. If you don't, you know, they've always had these controlled burns because if you have too much debris. That's right. When the trees get very high, yeah. you get a very dark environment when you get lots of debris, and that catches fire and makes things worse. So yeah. getting rid of that actually is a, considered a good way of getting of reducing the risk of fire. It's very controversial about how to manage things like that. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But there are there are extremists who who don't find any middle ground. Uh, there has been a lot of issue about the use of uh, fossil fuels, about oil, and there's, I'm not taking sides, but there's been an issue with the, uh, the, the pipeline, the gas pipeline that was shut down that caused 11,000 people to lose their jobs. Balancing the needs of nature and the environment with human, listen, we're dealing with this every day with with the pandemic about people's lives and keeping health and, and keeping people from work. And I mean, it's a big mess our society's dealing with. And, and, the, and one of the big issues that uh, will become a factor is uh, you know, the greenness of our environment. To what extreme levels are we gonna go to clean up fossil fuel usage? Uh, and what sacrifices we're willing to make to do that and what's going to be the human pain as a result of that? It's a real tough issue. Uh, but there have been examples, Len, and forget, you know, I, I, that's what I read once. But there might be other issues of, of the environment that people really have been hurt from uh, environmental extremists. Sometimes it's a fish or a special tree. And, and the question is, you know, how you balance the needs of people with the needs of the environment. Yeah. Um, I think. One of the things to think about when you deal with extremism or moderation mm -hmm. is to have modesty in thinking that you know all the answers. 
And it goes back to the thing. Exactly. That Good. So assumption, I, I read this. I, this is the way to go. I, I have all the answers. And if you have some modesty about your thinking, it leaves you open to maybe there's another opinion, another way of looking at it. Maybe we can meet the same goal by sharing ideas. I'm not always the one that knows everything. You, 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 you really uh, struck on an issue that's to me very important that we've lost this idea of learning from each other. Mm -hmm. I'm right, you're wrong. There's nothing to discuss. Uh, and it's a poison for a society. I don't wanna hear that speaker. I disagree, that speaker is evil. I'm not gonna listen to that speaker. You're right. We're not even talking about issues anymore. That's why we're so polarized as a society right now. We've, and, I, and I, again, I think we Jews can teach the world a lot about Talmudic pilpul, that is having different views on, on the same issue. We can argue about uh, balancing the needs of nature and the needs of people, and it's okay to have different views, and we shouldn't be cutting people out because they have, they question certain things that, uh, that we feel are, are right, and uh, those who oppose me are evil. That's, it's poison for a society, and I think we struggle. Every single day, I, I uh, read something that just, just blows me away in that, with that regard. The rhetoric, the, the insults uh, that people uh, are absorbing uh, on a daily basis is very troublesome. But anyway, so it just, again, proves how much Shabbat is needed. People have, have run away from, I think, our core religious values and Shabbat has it all. Peace with uh, ourselves, peace between people, peace with nature, and ultimately shalom, the peace that we make with our creator, with God. Uh, and that is to create a time of kedusha, of sanctity, a day of study, prayer, transcendence. From That's what we, and the kadosh, 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 we, we lift our heels because we know every time that we live in this day that we're trying to transcend the mundane and create a, uh, a world of holiness. Um, I have a note here, which we're gonna get into after we go through the structure of the Shabbat. And there, there is another, again, extremism, uh, and that is sometimes, and I've been involved with families that make Shabbat observance so strict that in my view, sometimes it becomes too onerous and takes away from the, the peace of the day. And um, i give you an example of that, the use of electricity. Um, and I've, I used to set Shabbos clocks. <laughs> so you, you'd go around room to room and set, set your timer. I'm going to sleep at 11 p.m. My lights will go out. So you'd have this automatic light system or you go to Israel and you stay in the hotel and the, and the elevator, you're on the 16th floor. And if, you, and if you're Shabbat observant, you go floor to floor to floor. And it takes a long time to get the elevator. Um, I have no problems using electricity. I think, you know, and if something finds their comfort level in observing to that degree that they'd rather be in the dark if they forget to set their Shabbos clocks. You know, I respect that, that's fine. But I, I never found using electricity to be a problem. And, and my, first of all, my basis for that is Rabbi Akiva did not exactly have to struggle with that issue. I think he lived before Thomas Alva Edison. <laughs> So the question is a really relatively new one. It's only the last, what, 100 something years. When was electricity invented? The end of the 19th century? When, 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 in the 19th century, yeah. So 120, 125 years. So, so it's a relatively new issue. And the, the question of electricity, which we're gonna get into, is only whether that uh, constitutes a uh, setting of, of a fire, of a creative fire unit and our conservative movement uh, wrote a very long uh, tshuva response on that issue. I think around 1955 that the use of electricity had absolutely nothing to do with making fire. That's an already existing source. When you put it on a switch, 
the fire element is already there. And so it's not like you're creating, it's not like um, igniting a fire in your fireplace. Um, I just think that with all these other details of observing Shabbat, that we always have to keep in mind the goal of, of shalom, of peace. I know it leaves a lot to the individual to decide what that what, what constitutes peace. But um, when Shabbat observance becomes so onerous, I'll give you an example from my own life. I was a rabbinical student. This was in New York. So I guess it was around 1978 or so. And uh, I used to spend Shabbat with a lot of my, my fellow students. We'd, we'd, we'd uh, stay overnight. And I remember we were at, I'm not gonna mention any names. We were at the home of a rabbi. We were very close. And it was like June 21st was the longest Shabbat of the year. So that meant Shabbat didn't end till around, I don't know, New Jersey. Then probably nine, nine thirty, maybe even ten o'clock. And I remember we were, I, I was perfectly fine. We walked, we ate all day long. And then it was around six thirty, we're sitting together, and my colleague was saying, Oh, I hate these long Shabbats. Uh, I mean, he was kind of a negative person anyway. And I loved it. I thought the longer the Shabbat, I was in in in, in heaven. But it was interesting, and I remember saying to him, I said, what, why, why is doing what we're doing so difficult? I mean, he said, well, I can't do this, I can't go out, we can't go out tonight, da, 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 da. And I felt sorry for him, because that means, to me, it meant he was just keeping Shabbat and like fighting it, rather than embracing it. And I always thought that was really weird. I, and I remember saying to myself, I'll never get to the situation time. If I felt I was doing something was making my Shabbat miserable, then I'm doing something wrong for me. And uh, I thought that was such an interesting, I remember that that was a turning point, a real warning sign. Don't let Jewish observance, especially a day that's supposed to be you know, total peace, to become so uh, difficult that you end up despising it. That's not good either. Okay, um, good. Living our ideals, we did that, living peace. I took, uh, did that. To what extent do we observe, I think is one of the, the great uh, issues here. And we know that Shabbat observance has changed. Uh, just one little issue here that I didn't cover. You know, there are different Sabbaths. There's a Christian Sabbath and Muslims don't call it a Sabbath. It's a, um, I don't know what they, it's interesting. I don't know what they call Friday, but it's not anything comparable, but Friday is a day they do shut their businesses and they have a, a longer prayer session in the middle of the afternoon. There's no, it's no, it's not Sabbath, but it, but it is interesting. It did begin with some roots to have a special day. The, um, of course, it says in the Torah that the seventh day is the Shabbat day, and everybody recognizes that seven days Saturday. So the question is, how did uh, Benjamin Franklin and Christian tradition in, embrace Sunday as their Sabbath day? Because they, again, tomorrow we're going to speak about the separation of this Jewish sect of Christians becoming a separate religion. And the fact that this new religion it was embraced more by non-Jews than by Jews, the Sunday was already the, um, the day that was uh, uh, the day of the emperor. It was, the, it was the, um, the special day, special offerings were brought, sacrifices in Rome. Uh, and so people were used to the Sunday already being their special day. And then Sunday, became very special in Christian tradition because Sunday was the day of the resurrection of their Messiah. And so Sunday developed this special sanctity. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting that uh, we have the uh, Mennonites here who observe Sunday quite strictly as their Sabbath. And that was the Sabbath when the pilgrims came to this country, they were very strict in their 
Sunday day. Stores couldn't be. Remember the days when we were young, when they would they would close all the stores, and and uh, uh, that was kind of a very the blue laws, yeah, which made it very difficult to be Jewish. If you were a store owner, you were closed on Shabbat, closed on Sunday. You're like cutting your your whole business half your business off. Um, so the the standard of the Sunday holy day is a very long one in in Christian tradition, and of course it was meant to break away. Uh, there were there were moments in Christian history. For example, the Seventh-day Adventists, I don't know what they do today. In fact, I drove by one of their, um, their churches when we were on the way to the park on Sunday morning, and we saw a Seventh-day Adventist church, but the lot looked pretty full. And I couldn't figure out why the Seventh-day Adventists were having services on Sunday, because I thought they were doing everything on Saturday now. But what do I know? Uh, Maybe you can enlighten me about that because there was a movement to try to go back to the seventh day as the Sabbath day. In some Christian circles, it didn't really work very well because the Sunday is the day of resurrection, Easter Sunday, uh, that tradition really was the dominant one. Now, as far as Muslims, you're, you're right, Len, it's not a Sabbath day, but there was an attempt to try to create a, a long, it's a longer prayer session. And I know that in, in London, uh, all the uh, Muslim store owners would close down uh, to go to the mosque on Friday afternoon and they would stay closed the rest of the day and there'd be a special family feast in the afternoon after the mosque. So they didn't call it a Sabbath day, but they tried to make Friday the special, special day. But you're right, they don't have any equivalent of a Sabbath day. So let's, um, let's go to in the minutes that we have. Let's start with a uh, Shabbat observance. Uh, when do you start preparing for Shabbat? Uh, in, in Jewish homes, you start preparing for Shabbat the moment that you end Shabbat. As I said, the days of the week lead to Shabbat. So the first three days, you have to figure out who am I going to spend Shabbat with? What food are we going to get? What, what special things? Whatever families do. There's no guideline with that. Shopping and cleaning and getting ready making sure that we have the halot and the wine ready for Shabbat evening. Um, oh, I wanna mention one thing before we get to the day here. Uh, and that is the word malacha. This is very interesting. Most people will tell you that the, and it does, the Torah, the Torah prohibits doing malacha on Shabbat. You're not supposed to do, the English translation does not do justice to the Hebrew. The prohibition, it'll say you shall not work on the Shabbat day, malacha. The problem with it is that in the Hebrew language, there are two verbs for work, malacha and avodah, uh, nouns. Malacha, work, and avodah also means toil or work. The only work that's prohibited on Shabbat is malacha not avodah. And it's interesting that the rabbis also translated avodah as worship. And I always get, not here yet, but someone say, Rabbi, it's the Shabbat. You're working so hard on Shabbat. But that's not what's prohibited on Shabbat. I'm, I, it's okay to work on Shabbat. Doing what I do is perfectly fine. And I'll give you an example of the differences. If I had a refrigerator in the middle of my living room and I have 10 guests coming for Shabbat and I wanna move the refrigerator on Shabbat, we're coming back from shul, there's a refrigerator right in the middle of the place. I wanna move the refrigerator from the third floor to the first floor. I get my buddies there. We lift the refrigerator we can go down 20 flights of stairs and to move the refrigerator, that's perfectly allowed on Shabbat. We might come back sweating and I wouldn't recommend doing that, but it's technically allowed because it's in my private domain. But if I found a feather on my uh, stairwell leading to my home and I took the feather in my hands and I moved it into the public street, 
I would technically be violating Shabbat. Now, there's a big difference between lifting a feather and moving a refrigerator. For example, uh, writing on Shabbat's prohibited. Um, plucking a fruit from a tree is prohibited on Shabbat. It doesn't take much work to do that. What is prohibited according to the Mishnah are 39 malachot, 39 works. Malacha is anything that changes the composition of what things are. It's considered to be an act of creative creativity, an act of building like God. They were taking after the 39 malachot of the building of the, uh, the Mishkan from those, all those chapters at the end of Exodus that are Vayakel Pikute that are quite detailed, but they were used to describe the different workings that are prohibited on Shabbat. So in other words, what is prohibited on Shabbat is not work. It is the malacha, the creative work. Um, avodah is allowed. Avodah with the purpose of Shabbat, whether it be prayer or study or moving things or cleaning things to make sure that you had Shabbat, that is perfectly fine. And this distinction is, all, is certainly lost in the English translation, I, I would, I would, um, okay, here we go. No, that's not what I want. Where would be the, let's see if the, if they has the Kiddush at the home on yeah, Shabbat. Is that why they have the, it's done by the right route, it goes around certain neighborhoods, that you have to stay within it. Uh, yes. So that, that you can work Jews the used to live in what called Chatzerot, in courtyard. They would have shared courtyards. And so they're there for, and the synagogue would be right in the courtyard. So they would carry and they'd go to the synagogue. What happened was that our, our living situations changed. And so the, the idea of the public thoroughfare became more pronounced with, uh, with us living separately. Let's see if in the weekday, that's Mincha. Where is the home? Mm. I'm trying to find where it has the, uh, the Ten Commandments in here. It would be in the, the Amidah that we recite in the after. Anyway, it says in, in, the, in the Torah that Malacha is, is what that which is prohibited and not of. Yeah. And that's an important distinction made. Yeah. Um, Rabbi, could I ask a question here? Just, yeah, just a, a very um, practical. Okay. I've done my laundry on Friday morning and I've hung it up on my drying rack. And by three o'clock Friday afternoon, it isn't dry. It's within my home. If I get up Saturday morning and I find it's dry, is that a prohibited thing to put it away? I should wait until after Shabbat? No, it's perfectly fine. Put okay, your clothes in. That's the question. Put them on the couch, yes. <laughs> put them away. <laughs> Shabbat. I, I think that you, my father always taught me, my dear father, bless him, Mary, be Jewish, use your seichel. Don't be, don't be crazy. Don't be crazy. Just, you know, Move the clothes, put them away, enjoy your Shabbat. <laughs> That's what I would do. So the, the Arab account around Miami allows it to be the Arab in, mm -hmm. within the city on Shabbat compared to Malachi. Yeah, what there's there's a subterfuge in Jewish law because again, as as Jews were changing their living situation, it became very hard to keep the prohibition of carrying in the public thoroughfare. If you had a six month old child and you didn't have a baby, you had to carry and you wanted the child to be with you, but it was prohibited from carrying your child, which to me is complete nonsense. Just carry your child, don't worry about it. But in a very observance as, uh, uh, circles, they, they are technically prohibited from carrying a talus bag or a child or anything 
in the public thoroughfare on Shabbat. That's why you'll see in Jerusalem before there was an Arab, there is an Arab now. But they, when I was a student there, there was no Arab and they would wear their talitot to synagogue because they wouldn't have to carry their talis uh, with them. Um, in, in London, I, I helped the Orthodox synagogue get an Eruv. It's not my thing, but it was their thing. And, and we helped them get that. Uh, that's why we be, I became very you know, closer friends with the Orthodox rabbi there. That's good. I don't mind that. I just, it, for me, it doesn't have much, it doesn't resonate. Um, and maybe it's because I grew up in a conservative synagogue and I was very comfortable. We always used to carry our talis bag with us uh, to synagogue. And I, I never found anything wrong with that, but the Orthodox would go and they, and they didn't carry their tully. But in, in most communities now, there's an Eruv that gives a, um, when you tie the string around the community, it makes the property private property rather than public thoroughfare. That's the legal subterfuge there. And so that allows people, Jews to carry on Shabbat. That's called the Eruv. Uh, Eruv means passageway. So it allows us to, 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 to pass through on Shabbat with our talis, with our children, with our whatever else we're carrying. How do you feel about driving? Okay, we're getting the driving, but let's go right to the jugular. Let's go right to ju 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 driving. Yeah, we're ready. Something ready in Israel make their people tear their toilet paper ahead of Shabbat. Don't ask me. To me, it's insanity. There's no prohibition. The, the prohibition of tearing in the Mishnah is tearing by design, which means if, if I had a scissors and I wanted to make a picture of a little girl or whatever, and I was cutting by design, that would be the technical prohibition. But they, they go beyond the requirements of the law and to, to, and they engage in absurdities like, like tearing toilet paper. I don't know about you, but I don't think of making anything when I tear toilet paper. And that's why most Orthodox in Israel don't. My friend's daughter is a Haredi, so I They cut the toilet paper before Shabbat. Yeah. You know, whatever they do, I, again, I always, I always, when I hear such a, uh, uh, things like that, I always tell people, ask the rabbi where the source is that would prohibit us tearing toilet paper on Shabbat. You won't find it because it's tearing by design. And when we tear toilet paper, I don't think we're designing, we're not making anything. That would be my halachic ruling. Use your toilet paper to your own delight. <laughs> Sounds absurd, but you know. Yeah. Yes, yeah. What's the difference or the definition between public and private domain? You have, because you have a, a private domain of a bunch of homes, of Jewish homes. Yeah. You have gated communities. Is that a public or private domain? Or you and have- That would be a pub, still highway. a public domain. Private domain would be, would be your private property where you live and your private property, which would include your lawn, your front lawn, but once you go into the street that's used with cars or people walking, it becomes a public thoroughfare. But as I said, I, you know, I can, I can understand why that was important back in the old days. They, they wanted to prohibit uh, commerce, trade, and they wanted to maintain the, the sanctity of the residents who lived in a certain courtyard that was shared to me, it doesn't have any relevance um, caring on Shabbat. I just, uh, I can understand that as a need from antiquity, the old days, but I think that uh, the way we've evolved as a society, I, I would find that crazy. But I wanna get to the question about driving. Again, in about 1955, the conservative movement dealt with this issue of driving. And if you're interested, I think it's a 55 page responsa on the subject on the uses of electricity and whether igniting the, the, the engine of a car is making fire or not. And the general ruling is that it's not. And the, the conclusion of that juva was 
because Jews were living farther away from the synagogue, even in the 1950s, Jews were moving to the suburbs farther away from the synagogue, that um, we wanted to make sure the Jews still, because there's the, the counter mitzvah, as I mentioned, we want Jews to be together. We want Jews to share Shabbat. And so the idea was we should not encourage driving, but we shouldn't discourage it either. That is kind of a goal, but it's not a halachic necessity any longer. You imagine if we, I'll never forget when I was in Connecticut and I was a very young rabbi and, and I had good relations with uh, the Orthodox rabbi in town. In fact, I, we did his uh, Tarach, Ever Kaddish for his congregants when they died and they did ours. So it was kind of a neat thing that we, that we did with the Orthodox community. Um, but I, he was very strident and he said, I'm going to teach these people. I'm tired of them driving to shul. And he chained the parking lot so that, that what happened was people were just disgruntled and angry. They had to park their cars and have a long walk. I said, this is ridiculous. You know, what, what are we trying to hide here? He had to, he had to take the chains off. Otherwise, he wouldn't have a congregation left. They did the same thing in the Marinette, New York. They chained the parking lot. Absolutely. And, and people were upset about it. And because so the people still want their cars. They, they just parked the farther away. It was an absurdity. Yeah. At the conservative yeah. synagogue. In the conservative synagogue. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. How did that come across? Did people. I didn't belong there, but I guess people. Did the conservative know. synagogue. Wow. That I never heard of before. So I prefer walking, but I. Uh, it's not a cornerstone for me. It's not a make or break situation. Um, I lived right, as Claire knows, I lived right across the street from the synagogue in London, so I never had to worry about that. But here it would be imp almost impossible for us to, uh, it's to be able to. In the yeah, and it's so hot in the summertime too, yeah. So it's uh, it doesn't work any longer. I'm comfortable with that. I don't, I don't think it detracts. Again, I think you got to, I, I respect those people who will only walk on Shabbat, but I think you've got to set, you know, your own kind of standards here. And, and again, not, not make it too, too cumbersome. So you're not enjoying the day. My goal is to enjoy the peace of Shabbat. And I, and I work from there. That those are the compromises I make. And so I, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't I, I'm so happy when people come to shul that I think uh, any way that you can get here is perfectly great with me. And I think everybody should be welcome in that regard. Uh, things have changed, especially in the United States. Now, it, it, it is true that if you're living in Jerusalem, it's pretty hard to have to drive on Shabbat because there's synagogues every block. But this isn't Jerusalem. So I... I don't, there, I don't think there's any uh, great call for people chaining up the parking lot here and making that an important issue. I'm happy. We have a huge turnout on Shabbat morning and I'm happy with everybody coming. And I think we do Shabbat pretty well because of that. That's my view. But anyway, we're, we're, we're kind of winding down. What I'm gonna do um, now next week, what is today? Today's the 14th. I'm not sure we have a schedule. I think we have like a three week break now. So when we come back, we're gonna go through an entire Shabbat and what is traditionally done and why it's done. And we'll go from there. I have a lot to do all the way through Havdalah. Some of the questions we brought up, Malacha, Avodah, using the telephone, using the computer, music, driving. So some of these things will be uh, repeated. Shabbos Goy. That's an interesting subject. Elvis Presley was a Shabbos, Shabbos goy. Colin Powell apparently was a Shabbos goy. Yeah, he learned how to speak, learn Yiddish when he did that. Um, so that's an interesting subject. Can you instruct a non-Jew to do something that you're not allowed to do? And the answer to that is no. You can give instructions to someone who's not Jewish before Shabbat. You can tell someone at three in the afternoon if you could move the chairs, put on the air conditioner, do all those things. You're technically, you're allowed to do that before Shabbat. 
make a meal, make my beds, do the wash. That you can do. But once Shabbat begins, you're not allowed to tell something, somebody who's not Jewish to do something that you're not allowed to do. Uh, I, we can't say uh, after Shabbat begins, uh, will you write that letter for me to this congregant? I, I can't write on Shabbat, but you can. I'll dictate to you. No, Rabbi, cannot do that. So uh, halacha makes sense and we'll make more sense of it when we, uh, when we continue. So let's call that. Tomorrow morning we'll be here for Jesus and Paul. I mean, a whole different subject. So I hope you enjoyed today. My pleasure. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.